The Machine Stops by E.M. Forster Dramatized by Gregory Normington with Gemma Jones and John McAndrew Imagine, if you can, a small room hexagonal in shape like the cell of a bee It is but one cell among countless millions of cells identical to its neighbors like a fraction of a giant hive There is no light from window or lamp yet the space is filled with a soft radiance There are no instruments or devices and yet at the moment this room is throbbing with musical sound In a lone armchair there sits a swaddled lump of flesh a woman about five feet high with a face as white as a fungus it is to her that the little room belongs another interruption you have 333 messages who is it me i know several thousand people you'll have to be specific Come on screen, mother. I must speak with you. Oh, very well. Let us talk. I can give you fully five minutes, Kuno, then I must deliver my lecture. Well? What is it, dear boy? Be quick. I really believe you enjoy dawdling. I have called you before, mother, but you were always busy. I have something particular to say. Well? I want you to come and see me. But I can see you. What more do you want? I want to see you not through the machine. I want to speak to you not through the wearisome machine. Oh, hush. You mustn't say anything against the machine. Why not? One mustn't. You talk as if a god had made it. Who knows? I believe that you pray to it when you are unhappy. Men made it. Don't forget that. Great men, but men. The machine is much, but it's not everything. I see something like you on this screen, but I do not see you. I hear something like you, but I do not hear you. What we get is an idea, a general impression of people. The machine cannot transmit nuances. Only something good enough. Good enough is enough. Not for me. That's why I want you to come, mother, so we can meet face to face and talk about the hopes that are in my mind. I can scarcely spare the time for a visit. The airship barely takes a day to fly between you and me. I dislike airships. Why? I dislike seeing the horrible brown earth and the sea and the stars when it's dark. I get no ideas in an airship. I don't get them anywhere else. But what kind of ideas can the air give you? Do you not know? four big stars that form an oblong and three stars together in the middle of the oblong and hanging from these stars three other stars I told you I dislike the stars I had an idea they were like a man I don't understand the four big stars are the man's shoulders and his knees the three in the middle are like the belts that men wore once and the three stars hanging are like a sword a sword in the past long ago men carried swords to kill animals and other men it doesn't strike me as a very good idea but it certainly is original the truth is i want to see these stars these curious stars again but not from the airship i want to see them as our ancestors did thousands of years ago I want to visit the surface of the earth. Who oh, no. That's honestly, you're trying to shock me. Mother, you must come if only to explain to me what is the harm of visiting the surface of the earth. There's no harm, no harm at all, but no advantage. The surface of the earth is only dust and mud. There's no life remains on it, and you would need a respirator or the cold of the outer air would kill you. One dies immediately in the outer air. I know. Of course, I shall take all precautions. And besides, what? <sighs> It is contrary to the spirit of the age. You mean by that contrary to the machine? In a sense, but Kuno? Kuno? Oh. Connecting. Have you bathed? There's a new scented deodoriser. It did wonders for my headache. What's the new food like? Quite horrible. I like the vitamin enhancers. Can you recommend it? Recommend what? The new food. I mean the deodorizer. What deodorizer? Cured my headache. The medical apparatus will take care of that. Any ideas lately? I've had no ideas of my own, but I've just been told one that four stars and three in the middle are like a man. Four stars? Uh, I I doubt there's much in it. Anyway, I must leave you. It's time for my lecture. Moving you to auditoria. 
Attendance connected. <coughs> Remote and primeval as were the methods of the Brisbane School, I yet feel that study of them might repay the musician of today. They have freshness. They have, above all, ideas. And this, dear colleagues, concludes my fifth lecture on the music of the Brisbane School. Delivered. Caution. Hot. How does it taste? Hmm. Not bad. Chemically enhanced. I don't think emulsifies add much. It's salty. It's too salty, isn't it? Phosphates. Good for the brain. I'm feeling tired. Installing bed. I have a feeling for a small bed. The bed I have is too large. I get quite lost in it. No use complaining. Beds are of the same dimension all over the world. To have an alternative size would involve vast alterations. Precisely. Look in the book of the machine. The Central Committee make it very clear. Page 1297, starting at subsection 12. Good night, all. Bed installed. I want to read the book. Providing... Oh, machine. Oh, machine. Kuno? No, Mother, I will not talk to you until you come. But why don't you come to me instead? Because I can't leave this place. Why? Because any moment, something tremendous could happen. Have you been on the surface of the Earth yet? Not yet. Then what is it? I will not tell you through the machine. Why should you go to him, Vashti? The airships are throwbacks from the old civilization. When people mistook the functions of the system and used it... For, for bringing, bringing people, people to things, things instead, instead of bringing things to, to people. All the same, there's something special about Kuno. But you've had many children. There's always something special about one's children. It's a genetic atavism. You have no duties towards him, Vashti. Consult the book. Page 1355. Parents, duties of, cease at the moment of birth. She knows that. I feel obscurely worried for him. Worried? Uh, concerned. Concerned? I mean, thoughtful. Kuno asked once to be made a father. Well, that's good. It shows he cares for the machine. He wants to contribute. His request was refused by the committee. I wonder why. Perhaps he is possessed of a certain physical strength. An athlete. Then that explains it. Not a type the machine desires to hand on. It's a demerit to be muscular. I didn't say he was muscular. It wouldn't be kind to let an athlete live. Not now that we can prevent it. Man must be adapted to his surroundings. That the machine may progress. That the machine may progress. That, that the, the machine, machine may progress, progress eternally. You're right, of course. Besides, Vashti, what's the good of going to London when it's exactly like Beijing? Thanks to the advance of science, the Earth is exactly alike all over. It's just useful nonsense. No doubt it is. But I must brave the journey if my son desires it. From a platform, via a tubular railway, via a lift, Vashti arrives outside the airship. Madam? Excuse me, madam? You must go up the gangway. Yes, but how? You'll have to walk like the others. Walk? Is there no conveyance? Not just here, I'm afraid. Oh. <gasps> What's happened? Why have we stopped? What happened? The young gentleman has dropped his book. So, let the floor raise it. It's impossible. The gangway is not so prepared. I'm sorry. My arm must have failed. <clears throat> Come along. We should be late. <sighs> the airships, indeed the whole business of travel, are greatly antiquated. Unchanged since the days when people had still, occasionally, to propel themselves. So Vashti, as she makes her way slowly up the gangway, is obliged, like the others, to tread on a copy of the world's only book. Ooh. 
Like countless others, this airship flies daily, regardless of wind or storm. Swiftly it ascends, rising from the vomitory into the outer air. Vashti, if she could bear to look out of the window, would see from her vestibule the surface of the buried city. Beneath those corridors of shining tiles are rooms, tier below tier reaching far into the earth. And in each room there sits a human being, eating, sleeping, or producing ideas. And buried somewhere, deep in the hive, is her own cell. Oh, machine. Oh, machine. I say, oh. let me have some light. I can see the stars. It's barbaric. I'm sorry, sir. You can pull down the blind. Oh, help! 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 What is it, madam? That light. Uh, there's a flaw in my blind. It, it's in my eyes. It's only the moon. Well, take it away! It isn't my place to mend the blind. I can't sleep here. I can only suggest you change cabin. Let me help you up. Oh, what? I, how dare uh, you touch me? I'm terribly sorry, madam. I... I meant to help you. I, I keep forgetting not to touch. Well, you forget yourself. I'm most awfully sorry. This way. Here. Yeah. This cabin's better. The blind works. Where are we now? We are over Asia, madam. Asia? You must excuse my common way of speaking. I've got into the habit of calling places over which I pass by their unmechanical names. Oh, uh, I remember Asia. The Mongols came from it. May I show you? Down there. Can you see those mountains to the right? Those are the Himalayas. They were once called the Roof of the World. What a foolish name. You must remember that before the dawn of civilization, they seemed to be an impenetrable wall that touched the stars. It was supposed that no one but the gods could exist above their summits. How we have advanced, thanks to the machine. How we have advanced, thanks to the machine. And that white stuff in the cracks, what is it? I have forgotten its name. Well, it can't be important. Cover the window, please. These mountains give me no ideas. Here I am. Yes. I have had the most terrible journey and greatly retarded the development of my soul. It is not worth it, Kuno. It is not worth it. Say what you want to say, and then I must return. I have been threatened with homelessness. I have been threatened with homelessness, and I couldn't tell you such a thing through the machine. But homelessness means death. Exposure to the air. Please, Mother, take my chair. <sighs> I have been outside since I spoke to you last. The tremendous thing has happened, and they have discovered me. But why shouldn't you go outside? It's perfectly legal, perfectly mechanical to visit the surface of the earth. I have lately attended a lecture on the sea. One simply summons a respirator and gets a permit. I begged you not to do it, but there is no legal objection to it. I did not get a permit. Then how did you get out? I found out a way of my own. A what? A way of my own. But that would be wrong. You're beginning to worship the machine. You think it irreligious of me to have found out a way of my own. It's just what the committee thought when they threatened me with homelessness. I worship nothing. I'm most advanced. All the fear and the superstition that existed once have been destroyed by the machine. Besides, there is no new way out. So it's always supposed. Yes, the book says so. Well, the book is wrong. For I have been out. On my feet. How do you mean... What are you saying? I began by walking up and down the platform of the railway outside my room. You know that we have lost the sense of space. Up and down I walked until I recaptured the meaning of near and far. Near is a place to which I can get quickly on my feet, not a place to which the train or the airship will take me quickly. Far is a place to which I cannot get quickly on my feet. You see, Mother, man is the measure. 
When I learned that, I called to you for the first time, and you would not come. But how did you get out? The city, as you know, is built deep beneath the surface of the earth, with only the vomitories protruding. As I walked and brooded, it occurred to me that our cities have been built in the days when men still breathed the outer air, and that there had been ventilation shafts for the workmen. For days I could think of nothing but these machine shafts. The traces of them remain. At last, I found a black gap in the tiles. I put my arm in and waved it round and round in ecstasy. I loosened another tile and put my head in. I'm coming. I shall do it yet. I seemed to hear the spirits of those dead workmen who had returned each evening to the starlight and to their wives. And all the generations who had lived in the open air called back to me. You will do it yet. You are coming. Don't. Don't talk of these terrible things. You are throwing civilization away. But I had got back the sense of space, Mother, and a man cannot rest then. I determined to get in at the hole and climb the shaft, and so I exercised my arms. Do you realise how wasted our bodies are and what a sin it is to ignore them and sedate them? Day after day I went through ridiculous movements until my flesh ached and I could hang by my hands. When I felt strong enough, I started. It was easy at first. The mortar had somehow rotted and I soon pushed some more tiles in and clambered after them into the darkness. And the spirits of the dead comforted me. We are here. What do you mean by that? Spirits of the dead? I don't know. I just say what I felt. I, I felt, for the first time, that a protest had been lodged against corruption. I felt that humanity existed, and that it existed without clothes. All these tubes and buttons and machineries neither came into the world with us, nor will they follow us out. Nor do they supremely matter while we are here. Stop. You make me miserable. There was a ladder made of some primeval metal. Perhaps our ancestors ran up and down it a dozen times daily in their building. I climbed, and the light from the platform helped me for a while. Then came darkness, and worse still, silence, which pierced my ears like a sword. Silence? The machine hums. Did you know that? Its hum penetrates our blood and may even guide our thoughts. Who knows? I was getting beyond its power. The next moment, I cracked my head against something. One of those pneumatic stoppers that defend us from the outer air. The stopper, which I felt with my hand, was perfectly smooth. I felt it almost to the centre. Nothing. And below me, a fatal drop. I can't explain how I lived through this part. But the voices of the dead spoke to me. Jump. It is worth it. There may be a handle. You may control and so come to us your own way. And if there is no handle? Then you fall and are dashed to pieces. It is still worth it. You will still come to us your own way. So I jumped. <laughs> my weight had set something in motion and the capsule opened. I was lying with my face to the sunshine. The stopper, with me clinging to it, had simply been blown out of the earth and the air that we make down here was escaping through the vent into the air above. It burst up like a fountain. I crawled back to it for the upper air hurts. And as it were, I took great sips from the edge. 
I was in a hollow in the grass, and luckily for me, for the artificial air fell back into that hollow and filled it as water fills a bowl. I was stranded. But at least I knew where I was. <laughs> this is Wessex! Do you hear hills? <laughs> You are Wessex! <laughs> the real earth under me, the sun shining on me through marbled clouds, and the peace, the sense of space, Mother. Wessex! Presently I stood, breathing a mixture of the two airs. My one aim was to get to the top of the slope where the ferns were and to view whatever objects lay beyond. Frantically, I tried to breathe the new air and to advance as far as I dared out of my pond of underground air. Oh, I don't believe this is interesting you. What? The rest will interest you even less. There are no ideas in it. Really? I shouldn't have troubled you to come with two different, Mother. No. You must continue. It was evening before I climbed the bank. You who have just crossed the roof of the world will not want to hear an account of the little hills that I saw. Low, colourless hills. But to me, Mother, they were living and the turf that covered them was a skin. I felt that they had called with incalculable force to men in the past and that men had loved them. Can't you see? Can't... All you lecturers see that we are dying, that down here the only thing that really lives is the machine. It has robbed us of the sense of space and the sense of touch. It has blurred every human relation and narrowed down love to a carnal act. It has paralysed our bodies and our wills, and now it compels us to worship it. The machine develops, but not on our lines. The machine proceeds, but not to our goal. Oh, I, I have no remedy. Or at least... only one. To tell men again and again that I have seen the hills of Wessex as Alfred saw them when he overthrew the Danes. Go on. Nothing that you say can distress me now. I am hardened to your blasphemies. I had meant to tell you the rest, but I can't. I know that I can't. Goodbye. Now, this is unfair. You have called me across the world to hear your story, and hear it I will. Tell me, as briefly as possible, for this is a disastrous waste of time, tell me how you returned to civilization. Oh, that. You'd like to hear about civilization. Certainly. For hours, artificial air had been rushing from the shaft, but now the fountain of escaping air played with less vigour, then eventually stopped completely. I'd entirely forgotten about the machine, and I paid no great attention at the time, being occupied with other things. Not until it was too late did I realise what the stoppage of the escaping air implied. You see, the gap in the tunnel had been mended. The mending apparatus. The mending apparatus was after me. It was dark now, but the moon shone into the dell at moments quite brightly. Suddenly I thought I saw something dark move across the bottom of the dell and vanish into the shaft. In my folly, I ran down, I bent over and listened, and I thought I heard a faint scraping noise in the depths. Of course, I took alarm. I realised something evil was at work, and I had better escape to the other air, and if I must die... Die running into the cloud that was the colour of pearl. I never started. Out of the shaft, oh, it's too horrible. A worm. A long, white worm had crawled out of the shaft and was gliding over the moonlit grass. That's how the machine defends itself, how it mends itself. These long, white, mechanical creatures... I did everything that I should not have done. I stamped upon the worm instead of flying from it, and it curled at once around my leg. Help! Help! 
Oh, the whole dell was full of the things. They were searching it in all directions. They were denuding it, and the white snouts of others peeped out of the hole. Suddenly, my feet were wound together. I was dragged away from the ferns and the living hills and back into the tunnel. The last things that I saw were certain stars. And I felt that a man of my sort lived in the sky. For I did fight. I fought to the very end. And it was only my head hitting against the ladder that quieted me. I woke up in this room. The worms had vanished. I was surrounded by artificial air, artificial light, artificial peace. And my friends were calling me on the system, wanting to know whether I'd come across any new ideas lately. There is nothing I can say. No. I shall go now. Cell open. Cell open. Kuno, it will end in homelessness. I wish it would. The machine has been most merciful. I prefer the mercy of God. By that superstitious phrase, do you mean that you could live in the outer air? Yes. Have you ever seen round the vomitories the bones of those who were expelled after the Great Rebellion? Yes. They were left where they perished for our edification. A few crawled away, but they perished too, who can doubt it? And so with the homeless of our own day, the surface of the earth supports life no longer. Indeed. Ferns and a little grass may survive, but all higher forms have perished. Has any airship detected them? No. Has any lecturer dealt with them? No. Then why this obstinacy? Because I have seen them. Seen what? Because I have seen them in the twilight. The homeless. Living on the surface. Because one of them came to help me when I called. Because she too was entangled by the worms and, luckier than I, was killed by one of them piercing her throat. Goodbye, Kuno. The years progress and mankind also. Vashti's life goes peacefully forward. She makes a room dark and sleeps. She awakes and makes the room light. She lectures and attends lectures. She exchanges ideas with her innumerable friends and believes she is growing more spiritual. As for me, sinful, sacrilegious Kuno, I am moved to the southern hemisphere, only yards, in fact, from my mother's cell. Since my escapade, we never communicate, having nothing in common. Have you, have you heard have the news? The news? Respirators have been abolished. What do you make of it, Vashti? It's a natural development. Only to be expected. Personally, I've always held it foolish to visit the surface of the Earth. Airships might still be necessary, but what's the good of going out for mere curiosity and crawling along for a mile or two in a terrestrial motor? I agree. The habit is vulgar. And faintly improper. It's unproductive of ideas and has no connection with the habits that really matter. But it's time for the sea lecture. I connecting to lecture. Some of my colleagues have complained that subsequent to the ban on respirators, they have been debarred access to their outer surface subject matter. This, of course, is plainly a nonsense. My lectures on the sea are nonetheless stimulating when compiled out of other lectures that have already been delivered on the same subject. With others, my colleagues the world over, I take up the call. Beware of first-hand ideas. <sighs> Changing venue. First-hand ideas do not really exist. Let your ideas, my fellow thinkers, be second-hand, and if possible, tenth-hand, for then they will be far removed from direct observation. Do not learn anything about this subject of mine, the French Revolution, 
Learn instead what I think that any shaman thought, Urism thought, Gooch thought, Ho Young thought, Chibo Singh thought, Lefkario Hearn thought, Carlyle thought, Mirabeau said about the French Revolution. Through the medium of these ten great minds, the subject will be clarified to an idea which you may employ most profitably in your daily lives. It's in the book now, Vashti. Really? I ordered the 600th edition and there it was, printed on the first page. The machine feeds us and clothes us and houses us. I like to repeat certain numerals. 227, 1528. However little meaning they convey to the outer ear. I don't listen to what the retrogrades say. Who does? Anybody who rejects undenominational mechanism lives in danger of homelessness. But don't you feel sorry for them? I mean for their unbelief. Think what they do without. The ecstasy of touching a button. The ringing of an electric <gasps> bell. Or praying to the mending apparatus. To the optic plates. The mending apparatus is the tangible manifestation of the machine. The optic plates are omniscient. I heard someone once speak sinfully of the mending apparatus. Sinfully? Why? What was said? Oh, it's not worth repeating. He compared them to worms. Long, white worms. White worms? Preposterous! Do we know this man? I believe he was granted euthanasia. Year by year, my brethren, we are making progress. Invincible passion gratified. The better a man looks upon it, the less he understands the duties of his neighbour. And in all the world, there is not one who understands the machine as a whole. For the whole of the machine is greater than the whole. We are smaller than the machine, though equal in its sight. We can see its workings partly, comprehend it partly. But in its benevolence, it is beyond us and above us all. Blessed is the machine. Who is it? You have 212 messages. My screen is blank. Identify yourself. Mother... Kuno? What is it you want? Do you want me to visit you? Never again, do you hear? Never. The machine stops. What? I can't hear you. Come on screen. The machine stops. What did you say? The machine is stopping. I know it. I know the signs. <laughs> Can you imagine anything more absurd? A man who was my son believes that the machine is stopping. It would be impious if it was not mad. The machine is stopping? What does that mean? The phrase conveys nothing to me. Nor to me. He's not referring, I suppose, to the trouble there has been lately with the music. Oh, no, of course not. Let, let us talk about the music. Well, have you complained to the authorities? Yes, and they say it wants mending and referred me to the committee of the mending apparatus. I complained of those curious gasping sighs that disfigure the symphonies of the Brisbane School. They sound like someone in pain. The committee of the mending apparatus say that it will be remedied shortly. Oh, oh, oh this is intolerable. Connecting to committee of mending apparatus. Welcome. What is your question? I wish to ask about the music, in particular the music of the Brisbane School. I lecture on the subject. Welcome. What is your question? I wish to know when the mending apparatus will repair matters. The defect will be set right shortly. Shortly? At once? Why should I be worried by imperfect music? Things are always put right at once. If you do not mend it at once, I shall complain to the Central Committee. No personal complaints are received by the Central Committee. Through whom am I to complain? Through us. I complain, then. Your complaint shall be forwarded in its turn. But others have complained, haven't they? Your question is unmechanical. Time passes without improvements, and Vashti learns to resent the defects no longer. Like her friends, 
She adapts herself to every caprice of the machine, and things go from bad to worse, unchallenged. Until, that is, the failure of the sleeping apparatus. <sighs> I'm tired. I want to sleep. I said I wish to sleep. Installing. 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 Throughout the world, in Sumatra, in Wessex, in the innumerable cities of Brazil, the beds, when summoned by their tired owners, fail to appear. It may seem a ludicrous matter, but from it we may date the collapse of humanity. I've no bed to sleep in. I'm tired. What's happening? I must sleep. This is not a matter for the committee of the sleeping apparatus. Refer all complaints, all complaints to the committee of the mending apparatus. I can't do without sleep. My ideas are suffering. Why can't you do something? Thank you. Your complaint shall be forwarded to the central committee. But we must be saved. Euthanasia is out of order. There's no more euthanasia. Pain is returning. Courage, brothers and sisters. What matter our discomfort so long as the machine goes on? Attention, attention. Will the inhabitants of Sumatra please familiarize themselves with the workings of the central power station? Moving you to auditorium. Attendance connected. Welcome. Today I shall be resuming my lecture on the late symphonies of the Brisbane School. Before I begin, however, I would like to read the following statement from the Central Committee. The mending apparatus, after extensive work, is almost functional. Furthermore, the enemies of the machine, all retrogrades and cynics, have been silenced. Throughout the world, new nerve centres are evolving, which will do the work even more magnificently than before. Praise be to the machine. What's happening? Talget, are you there? Talget? Poverty? Poverty, come on screen. Galena, Roberto? It can't. If eternity stops, it will be set going again shortly. There is still a little light. There is still a little air. There is still the book. And while there is the book... What's that? My ears! Vashti has never known silence. And the coming of it nearly kills her. It does kill many thousands of people outright. Ever since her birth, she has been surrounded by the steady hum of the machine. It is to the ear what artificial air is to the lungs, and in its absence, agonizing pains shoot across her head. People are crawling about. People are screaming. Every moment, dozens are pushed off the train platform onto the live rail. Some are fighting round the electric bells, trying to summon trains which cannot be summoned. Others are yelling for euthanasia, or for respirators, or blaspheming the machine. And behind all the uproar, is silence. The silence which is the voice of the earth and of the generations who have gone. Blessed is the machine. Blessed is the machine, omnipotent and eternal. Oh, 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 oh not the light. Not the light. Oh, oh. Slowly, the brilliancy of Vashti's world is dimmed. Light follows the flight of sound. Air is following light, and the original void is returning. Oh, praise be, machine. Praise be, machine. Oh. 
Basti! What? Basti! Yes, yes! I'm coming! Basti! Quickly! Hold on! Hold on! It is thus that my mother opens her prison and escapes. Escapes in the spirit, at least. The rush of foul air on her skin, the loud throbbing whispers in her ears, tell her that she is facing the tunnel again, where she saw men fighting. They are not fighting now. They are dying, by hundreds, out in the dark. This darkness? Say something, I can't find you. Where are you? Here. Oh. Oh. Is there any hope, Kuna? None for us. You're bleeding. The riot. What must I do? Sit by me. Quicker. I am dying. But we touch. We talk. Not through the machine. The city is breaking like a honeycomb. The last thing we will see is the sky. Oh, my boy. (laughs) We have come back to our own mother. We die, but we have recaptured life. As it was in Wessex, when Alfred overthrew the Danes. (laughs) We know what they know outside. But, Kuno, is it true? Are there still men on the surface of the earth? Is, is this is this tunnel, this, this poison darkness really not the end? I have seen them. Spoken to them. Loved them. They are hiding in the mist and the ferns until our civilization stops. Today, they are the homeless. Tomorrow? Tomorrow, some fool will start the machine again tomorrow. Never. Never. Humanity has learned its lesson. Part of Vashti was played by Gemma Jones and Kuno by John McAndrew. Voice one and the flight attendant, Connie Walker. Voice two and the preacher, Christian Rodska. Voice three and the lecturer, Anne Carroll. Voice four and the young man by Fergus Webster. And the computer by Jilly Mears. E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops was dramatized by Gregory Normington. It was directed by Jane Morgan and produced by Marilyn Imrie. The Machine Stops is a Catherine Bailey production for BBC Radio 4.